Hey everyone, my new Minute here, coming at you guys with some comic book reviews, non-Batman related today. Lately I've been really enjoying digging into some old Wildstorm stuff. Um, it really started because of the Grifter storyline that was in Batman Urban Legends. Uh, I really enjoyed that storyline. If you were watching my reviews at the time, I was just gushing about that. Week after week I just thought it was really funny and entertaining it had great art and teased all this wildstorm stuff that i just hadn't thought about in probably 10 years i remember reading captain adam armageddon back when that was a thing captain adam jumped universes into the wildstorm universe if i remember correctly and then i also read a handful of issues of the authority it wasn't one of like the definitive runs on that book but i remember really liking those characters and wanting to read more and i've just kind of never gotten around to it and so this summer that's kind of turning into my activity because I recently picked up the Jim Lee Wildcats Omnibus which I'm going to be sitting down reading and giving a review for you guys at some point in the not too distant future and then also referring back to a prior shout out video I did on a Monday I read Voodoo the new 52 book Voodoo which was interesting because um you know Voodoo was part of the Wildcats and then when the new 52 started they kind of broke up all these Wildstorm characters into all these solo books. Like, Grifter had a solo book, Voodoo had a solo book. I talked about those books already. And then the one team they kind of kept going was Stormwatch, which is the team that preceded the Authority, that eventually turned into the Authority sometime in the mid to late 90s or whatever. And so that's been kind of my reading project over the last couple weeks, was digging into the Stormwatch New 52 books and um, I found these to be a lot of fun actually. Some really interesting concepts, some of the cool things that the New 52 had to offer in terms of like greater continuity. They were working really hard at connecting all these books together. Some of them did that gracefully, some of them did not. Stormwatch did it in a really interesting way and I'm kind of discovering that all the writers that the New 52 had in their you know writers pool at the time Paul Cornell, really unsung hero of the New 52. Like, he didn't do any of the, like, really flashy big titles that everybody remembers. But he did Demon Knights, which is a book that was one of my favorites. And I'm actually really excited to go back to, especially now, which we'll get into that in a little bit. But then he also did the Stormwatch books. Now, I only read the first three volumes. There is technically a fourth volume, but this is the complete... Paul Cornell series. It kind of ties everything in a nice neat bow and then there was a volume 4 that collects like 10 or 11 more issues but those were written by Jim Starlin. Uh, they have a different logo on the front. The trade paperback for that one I do have, I just haven't read it uh, and it's called Reset so if that tells you anything maybe not something worth you know reviewing here. But getting into the book itself, so here is volume 1 and this has the most consistent artwork in it. You know it's certainly pretty dated it's got some like glaring you know computer effects and like photo insertion which you still see in comic books now uh, I don't know that they do it any better now than they did then but it certainly feels a bit dated here for whatever reason it's a pretty dark story uh, very much a who watches the watchmen these are very super powerful beings you know they're keeping an eye on the Justice League uh, as a potential threat to them. So the idea is that they are somehow above that. They talk about the Green Lantern Corps and how, you know, that's like amateur hour compared to them. There's a lot of like, you know, shit talking going on actually in this book, trying to build up Stormwatch to be, you know, maybe more than it actually is. As much as there's a lot of punching, a lot of monsters, a lot of action, um, the core underpinning thing that makes this book fun is going along the ride with these characters and seeing how they interact, how they start sort of distrusting each other. This is definitely a book that emphasizes the human drama. And as the book continues on later into the series, one of the major villains that they end up going up against actually ends up being a former member of the team that you're following early in this first trade paperback. Of all the new 52 Wildstorm stuff that they tried to do, they really wanted to integrate, you know, the DC universe and the Wildstorm universe. I would say, you know, as much as I enjoyed Voodoo, it was largely unsuccessful. Stormwatch, on the other hand, I think does a much better job of justifying its existence compared with something like Voodoo. You have a decent integration of DC characters onto the roster of the team. So of course, you know, the big addition 
was Martian Manhunter, who appeared for the first 12 or so issues before shuttling off into whatever other thing that they had going on with his character in the New 52 era. I honestly don't really have any idea. <laughs> because they had kind of taken the Justice League in a different direction, in a weird way, you know, he fit better on this team based on his place on the Justice League than he would have fit on the Justice League as Jeff Johns was writing it at the time. So I thought that that was actually a very clever uh, editorial decision overall, and I thought that that was really neat. The other thing that's fun about this book is just the creativity uh, in terms of, like, big concepts. And this is where we get into some of the tie-ins to other DC books. But looking at the roster of, you know, power sets that each of these characters brings to the table, um, you know, you have Midnighter, who is, you know, the ultimate tactician, sort of a Batman. You have Apollo, who is powered by the sun. He's, you know, clearly an analog for Superman. And then you get into some of the other characters, where, you know, you have a character that can communicate with the spirit of a city. It's one of those concepts that's ultimately unexplainable, and you just kind of roll with it, because the way they use it is interesting and clever. You have Jenny Quantum in this, who is, like, a 13-year-old who can, like, manifest mathematics to change the fabric of reality <laughs> which is uh pretty bonkers and there's some great friction on the team where midnighter in particular sees her as a threat and at times will literally you know leave her to die knowing that probably humanity is better off without her of course you know someone who can change the fabric of reality probably not a person you want to cross and there's some great moments in here where they kind of delve into that and then possibly the most interesting character um who this person ties into the greater dc universe and the interconnectivity of the books um is adam one who is someone who is aging in reverse so you see him as a young man here and if you read demon knights which as i said is one of my sort of unsung favorite new 52 books you don't hear people talk about it anymore um, but it turns out that Demon Knights is literally the medieval version of Stormwatch. And he's a member on that team as well as an old man, which is a really cool twist. And he happens to be Merlin. So really just an interesting ensemble of characters that makes for some great creative writing and great connective tissue to the other things you were seeing in the DC Universe at the time. I was particularly tickled finding out that Adam One is actually Merlin from Demon Knights, and the fact that he's the person that ultimately causes the creation of Etrigan the Demon, as we sort of know him in the DC Universe, who's a member of that team, and all these other great magic users from the DC Universe that all ended up in that medieval book. Just thinking about that book now is making me want to go back and, and reread Demon Knights, actually, but um, that's a really clever twist, actually, and a really great way to create connective tissue between, you know, the various books that DC was putting out at the time without relying on, you know, cameo appearance from the Red Lanterns, which I just throw that in there as an example because you literally just saw it here. But you know what I mean, you know, the characters popping into each other's books is like a fun cameo and all. But the ramifications of like an ancient Stormwatch um, and getting to see that, not knowing that that's what it is in another ongoing title, is really something I have to applaud DC for. That's a great editorial decision, in my opinion. As we got into Volume 3, especially Volume 3, I'll say, uh, the art just wasn't quite as consistent. We end up with art by uh, Will Conrad, for the most part, in this. And then it's supported by uh, Cliff Richards who has a pretty distinctly different style. As you're leafing through the book, you'll notice it popping back and forth. And especially in Volume 3, one of the things I noticed is it would happen mid-issue. The first half of the issue would be illustrated by Will Conrad, and then the second half of the issue would be illustrated by uh, Cliff Richards. And, you know, I mean, it's not the worst by any means, but, you know, I always complain about consistency with artwork, uh, <laughs> and I have to be consistent. It bothered me here, too. The other thing I'll say is... I don't know that this book completely sold me that, you know, Stormwatch is operating at a whole other level above, like, the Green Lantern Corps, especially when you think about how powered the Green Lanterns were with all the different Skittle colors going on and everything that was Green Lantern at the time. I'm really skeptical that Stormwatch was, like, one up on the Guardians that, you know, you they can say that they are, 
but the book doesn't necessarily demonstrate that it is because ultimately like they're just there to protect the earth from alien threats you know it's actually very pedestrian it's kind of the same problem as voodoo had where with the exception of the internal conflicts on the team and the villain that comes from within the team uh, and becomes a primary villain later on, you know, a lot of the villain aspects of this are a little bit underwhelming compared with what was going on elsewhere in DC at the time. And so I don't think that this book needed that. Like, the whole point was, you know, they're sort of super team counter-programming because they're characters with unique foibles that are different from other DC characters. Their power sets are different than other DC characters with the exception of Apollo and Midnighter. The other thing I'll say about the writing that kind of bugged me was towards the end, uh, two of the major plot twists around who the villains were and who sort of becomes the villain at the very end, I believed. It made sense. I thought it was interesting and, you know, made me want to turn the page and just keep reading. I burned through this volume three, by the way, uh, much quicker than I did the first two because I just had to find out what happened next. However, um, the conflicts that it creates within the team. There's an element where, you know, Apollo and Midnighter, as you can see here actually, are in conflict because of how they've been set up by the true villains of the story. And this felt very contrived to me. There's this subplot where they're dealing with implanted memories and supposedly Midnighter did something that he didn't actually do. And at no point did Apollo question and say, well, let's look at Midnighter's memories and see what his memories were. And it seemed like kind of a no-brainer. Like, it was one of those situations where, you know, it was all about getting these two characters to fight each other. And, you know, the ends justified the means. And they didn't do a good enough job actually justifying it, at least in my opinion. So that was a little bit of a bummer. But otherwise, this story was largely on point. And, you know, if you liked The Authority, probably this is a title you would like. Uh, at some point, I'm going to circle back and read through both the Warren Ellis and uh, Mark Millar authority books and see how those hold up today. I think even now, those have a pretty solid reputation in the community, so I'm curious to see how this actually holds up against it. Um, I suspect it might be somewhat the red-headed stepchild of them, which is partly why I actually deliberately chose to read this first, because I wanted to give it a fair shake, and I'm a little worried that if I sit down and read Warren Ellis, and then I burn through these, that these are maybe going to seem like, you know, fluff. Have you read these Stormwatch books? Did you like them? Uh, did you read them at the time? Have you picked them up in trade and read them after the fact? Most importantly, have you read Demon Knights? Because Demon Knights is half the fun of this Stormwatch book, if I'm being completely honest, and I am excited to go back and give those a reread. If you've never checked out Demon Knights, I really do strongly recommend that book. Uh, just a really, really fun title. Great hidden gem from the New 52 era. But that about wraps me up. I hope you guys enjoyed this ramble. I hope you guys enjoyed the journey with me, and uh, I hope you guys have a great week in comic books. I'll see you guys very soon, and take care.